This is this is Lynn Hollander Savio, first speaker. Okay, just a second. Lee, now we're gonna play start off by playing um, a little speech some of you may remember from December 2nd. Not today's anniversary, but two months down the line. And um, you the voice you hear, I think many people will recognize it's the voice of Mario Savio. And let's hope technology works. Lost input? All right, somebody who knows something. Okay, we'll, we'll skip that one. <laughs> we'll come back to it. They're working on the technology. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 50 years ago today, if you were coming out of that class there, you would have seen a police car in the middle of this plaza. And in that police car, there was sitting a man around that police car there were a bunch of students lying on the ground. And around them, more students sitting. And as the minutes passed, more and more students were sitting there. And you might ask, why is that person in the police car? It was a very simple thing. He had started an hour before, maybe 10 minutes before, sorry, sitting at a table at the base of these steps. He was handing out leaflets for the Congress of Racial Equality. I don't know what the leaflets said. They probably said there was going to be a demonstration. He was collecting money for that. That's all he was doing when somebody from the dean's office came over, asked him to identify himself, and when he couldn't produce a reg card, had him arrested. They, Jack went limp and good civil rights style, and they brought a police car onto the middle of the campus, middle of Sproul Plaza, put him in it, but somebody yelled, sit down, and a lot of people sat down. More and more people began to sit down, and they stayed there for 32 hours. You might ask, how come he was arrested for sitting at a table and passing out literature? We have tables here all the time, they, you say, advertising a whole bunch of causes. But in the fall of 1964, you couldn't have a political table on this campus. They put you at the entrance on Bancroft, and you had a 26-foot strip to put your tables, hand out literature, advertising, the civil rights actions and the farm worker support actions that were going on, signing up members to come to those tables and raising money for those causes. You had a 26-foot strip to do that only because the university had forgotten that they still own that piece of property. When they discovered it, because somebody from the Oakland Tribune called to remind them of that and to remind them of the fact that people were leaving from Berkeley and picketing the Oakland Tribune for unfair hiring practices. The university sent out a notice that we could not have tables there, that there would be no social and political advocacy to improve conditions in the United States or elsewhere on this campus. We're now having a delegation from the students. Okay. Welcome, students.
students of UC of today. Negotiations broke down and it went on to a sit-in. And the right to have campus tables to advocate political and social action and social change from this campus was firmly established. They've tried to take that right away from time to time, but people have resisted. And today, they are still enjoy that right and will resist any attempt to take it away. I'm going to turn the rally over now for a greeting to the ASUC Vice President for External Affairs, Caitlin Quinn, if she is here. here. Caitlin, okay, she'll have a brief welcome to you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming out. This is really exciting for me as a student. Um, I've been here four years and I haven't seen anything like this in my time, so I really appreciate everyone being here. But to do my best to honor the legacy of the free speech movement, I wanna talk about the power of an organized student body. When I talk about the ASUC, our student government here at Cal, I like to remind everyone that we're the most autonomous student government in the country. And trust me, I've seen a lot of different student governments across the state and across the nation. And we are the only entity on this campus that every single student has the power to change. While some students are involved in the hiring of different administrators, ASUC elected officials are chosen annually at the discretion of the student body. And trust me, we are a very smart, very critical student body. And because we are so smart and critical, I want us to look at why we talk about the free speech movement as if it were ancient history. I posit that this framework is no accident. 50 years may have gone by, but our administration continues to dismiss many of our concerns. Our administration celebrates and even touts the free speech movement, but they are the institution forcing students to protest and occupy. We, we have the freedom to speak, but are they listening? They aren't, that's the good answer. <laughs> you wrapped it up. As a campus, we must remember, honor, and teach our history of unrelenting activism, including who caused a need for activism. As a campus, we must recognize and collaborate with other powerful student movements across the globe, such as the students of Hong Kong who right now are demanding free and fair elections. As a campus, we must support each other and build coalitions to effectively tackle all the different problems students face. Because 50 years ago, students fought for your right to ask the hard questions, so now it is our duty to exercise that right and fight the fights that future students will remember us for. Thank you all. Thank you. We have a message also to the students of Berkeley from Edward Snowden. So I'm gonna introduce Jack Brady who will read that message to you. It was just received this morning. We've had a request from the back of the crowd if the people in front could sit, possibly, so that the speakers can be seen. Many of them are shorter than I am. This is a statement from Edward Snowden, an American hero.
we out there? Can we do it? I think we have the troops here. We got the energy. We got the will. And yes, we will make it happen. Se puede o no se puede? And the mama wait, wait, wait. Let's bring everybody with us. And the mama said, yes, we can in Spanish. It's si se puede. Let's all do it together. Let's go. Si se puede. Si se puede. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to introduce you to you now one of the important people from the free speech movement. She was one of the first people to get uh, suspended for, uh, you know, passing out leaflets. She. Um, Later, became a state assemblywoman in California, and uh, now uh, works at UCLA in the social justice teacher education program. She spent her life uh, with dedication to education in the state of California, as well as other issues. Jackie Goldberg. <laughs> Well, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see a crowd in Sproul Hall Plaza. You know, one of the things about a 50th anniversary is we all look so old. I don't know what happened to those 50 years. They just went quickly, didn't they? Everybody here who was in the Berkeley Free Speech Movement in 1964, raise your hand. You know, that tells you something. It tells you that we built a community, that people want to see each other after 50 years is because we built a community. We built a community from the left, from the right, from the center. Democrats, Republicans, communists, socialists, reactionaries, libertarians, all came together around one idea that a person does not lose their rights as citizens of the United States when they come onto the campus of the University of California. <clears throat> Many of us have been involved in movements all our lives since that date. Now, I'm just going to name a few, and if you've been involved in it, raise your hand. The civil rights movements. All right, how about women's reproductive and abortion rights? LGBT, the lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and transgender rights. Anti-war, anti-imperialism, anti-Vietnam fights. Uh, labor union struggles. Uh, bah, 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 bah. And women's liberation. Why, how could I forget that one? Oh my God, I would get clobbered. <clears throat> Why were we in all of those movements? Why are we still involved? We are still involved because the repression from the right has been greater than we expected. We didn't know that they were going to steal everything that wasn't nailed down. And when they finished that, they were going to steal everything after prying it up that was nailed down. We didn't know they were going to take that wealth and decide that students would ever come out of debt in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to get an education. We didn't know they were going to say that people don't need labor unions, don't need pensions. We didn't know those things. So we have to stay fighting. But I'm hopeful. Why am I hopeful? Look at the people behind me. That's where our hope is. <laughs> Look at you out there. Look at you students out there. Yeah, you're why I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because you know, you know that the forces of evil are small in number and we are many. We are many. We are many. And if we can do those kinds of community building things, cross lines of ideology, cross lines of practice, cross lines of social movements, if we can do that, if we can build community, we can change this country into a democracy. <laughs> and this time, it will be not only a political democracy, it will be an economic democracy as well. 
So here's what I say to you. I know it's terrible. I didn't listen to advice of people then, but I'm gonna give you a little advice anyway. Listen, not just talk when you're organizing. Listen, not just talk. Make sure that you reach out and support each other's efforts, not just the ones you are personally in. And here's the most important. Every morning, get up and look in the mirror. And as you're brushing those dentures, say to yourself, say to yourself, I will not be cynical today. I will not be cynical today. I will not believe the crap that everybody is in it for themselves. I will not believe that everybody is corrupt. I will not believe the propaganda that is designed to make me think it is hopeless. It is never hopeless as long as you resist. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. Next speaker will be the Distinguished Professor of Feminist Studies at UCSC, and maybe her more important title, Steering Committee Member during the FSM, Bettina Aptecker. Thank you so much. It is a joy to be here today. I share Jackie Goldberg's optimism and Dolores Huerta's beautiful words. And I was thrilled as I entered Sproul Hall Plaza to see all of those tables up, advocating and educating and petitioning. And it's just terrific. And that's what we were fighting for 50 years ago. And that that at least still prevails, not only here, but on so many campuses around the country is very gratifying, however far we have yet to go. I wanted to emphasize the extent to which FSM was indebted to and part of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Coming out of Mississippi, coming out of protests in San Francisco, that's already been said, I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I wanna emphasize that it was the black students in the South, the black sharecroppers in the South, the black church women in the South who rose this country up and awakened us, who created the dynamics of moral authority that Martin Luther King Jr. then appropriately claimed. But never forget, never forget where the real impetus for that movement came from and then helped us here on this campus. One of the key things we learned in that movement was the power of mass movements and coalitions. And it was through that, including the labor movement in this area, the farm workers of which Dolores Huerta was a leader with Cesar Chavez, it was through that and the civil rights coalitions here in the Bay Area and then the faculty on December 8th that finally broke the back of the regents and the governor and forced them to recognize that they would not go beyond the first and 14th amendments to the United States Constitution and that they would guarantee freedom of speech and equal opportunity before the law. I also today take great inspiration from the tens of thousands of folks that filled the streets of Manhattan 10 days ago as the United Nations commenced the liberations on climate change. What a demonstration of people's power that was, starting with indigenous people's ceremony in Central Park, a coalition that included African Americans, indigenous peoples from all over the world, Asian Americans, Latino, Chicano, Puerto Rican peoples, white middle class, working class of all hues and ethnicities and the LGBT community. It was everybody. It was everybody. And it was a tremendous, they estimate, 400,000 people. Changing the politics and posturing around climate change has got to be a number one priority. If we don't do that, we won't have a planet in which to argue about the First Amendment. 
I also want to just endorse, embrace our sisters and brothers in Hong Kong today. That's what these yellow, the yellow uh, ribbons that we're wearing in solidarity with the courage of those students in that pro-democracy movement. I want to say that in the last years, tens of thousands of people in this country have marched for immigration rights, have demanded the DREAM Act be passed, and have done everything they can to stop the roundup of so-called undocumented people. One million people marched in Washington in April 2004 for reproductive freedom. I'm enumerating these things because we get these protests as sound bites on the evening news and then forget that they happened. And then the media says there's no student movement anymore, that people are apathetic, that they're not really organizing. It's not true. Don't believe it. And that's the cynicism that Jackie Goldberg was responding to. Don't believe it. And don't let it stop you from engaging in meaningful social justice and peace movements that need to happen. One final comment. There's all these new technologies like Twitter and smartphones and so on make possible almost instantaneous communication and we can see the role of this has played in many protests around the world, including in Hong Kong now, but also in the Arab Spring, all over the world. But I want to emphasize to you that there is no substitution for grassroots, face-to-face, -face, day to day neighborhood-to-neighborhood -neighborhood organizing. There's no substitution for that. That is what inspires people. That is what gets people to understand that their issues that they're concerned about are connected to other issues, that we are all part of one another. Then we can have a vision and propose to people a vision of a world in which there is peace and social justice and great happiness. Thank you so much. started this rally by telling you about a man who was sitting in the, a police car in the middle of this plaza being taken away because he had dared to hand out leaflets supporting racial equality. That man is here with us today. I'm going to introduce you to Jack Weinberg. Yeah. <clears throat> His He's currently uh, a senior and policy advisor for IPEN, an international environmental rights organization that's fighting toxic pollution. And uh, here is Jack, out of the car. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out. A week ago, if somebody would have asked me what was the most important student protest movement of the last 50 years, I would have confidently said the Berkeley Free Speech Movement. But that was a week ago. On Monday and Tuesday, we were upstaged. The most, probably the most significant student movement of our era is taking place as we speak, in Hong Kong. This has been building for over a year. In June, the, the issue, if those of you who are not reading the newspapers don't know, the issue is the right to free elections. In 2017, the citizens of Hong Kong have been given the right to vote but with a trick. All candidates have to be approved, both by the authorities in Beijing and by the business establishment in Hong Kong. That's very much like the right to vote in Iran. You can vote as long as nobody you vote for wants to change anything or wants to do anything to upset the status quo. Last June, the citizens of Hong Kong held an online referendum 
on the right to nominate their own candidates. Even though it was hacked by the authorities and was down, over 900,000 people participated in that referendum. Today, October 1st, is a national day in China, and the protests were supposed to start today. But the, student fe the Hong Kong Federation of Students, which is an organization of all university students in Hong Kong, and Scholasticism, an organization that began as high school activists, jumped the gun and began the Occupy Central on Monday. They were confronted with tear gas and attacked, and as a result, all of Hong Kong, other than the party and the business establishment, came to their support. No accurate figures e exist, but at least 100,000 people today are sitting in the streets of Hong Kong. They are demanding a change in the way elections happen. Happen. They are demanding the executive stand down. And they've said if they don't get their demand soon, they will start occupying buildings. I want to read you a statement from the organizer of this rally, but I hope I am speaking for all of you. We support your Occupy movement for free elections and democracy in Hong Kong, and we call for police restraint. University and high school students are leading the way. Today, October 1st, marks the 50th anniversary of the Berkeley Free Speech Movement. Our officials repressed us in 1964, but our struggle for free speech prevailed. Today, we are officially honored and recognized. You will be honored and recognized as well. The whole world is watching. There are Hong Kong students around the plaza. They have yellow ribbons that represent this movement. I'm hoping they will give them out. They have literature. This is their banner. And I want to. <coughs> This wasn't what I was planning to say today, but I think it was what had to be said today. I think that our movement in Berkeley inspired young people and activists around the world. People who were conservative, were tired, were afraid, were isolated before that, and they came together and stood up. The Hong Kong students taking part in a movement that started with Occupy with Peace and Love, Centra, Occupy Central with Peace and Love, are now setting up another image, another example for the whole world to follow. Just when things seem too conservative to make a difference, just when things seem impossible, the opportunity arises. One has to struggle in the conditions you live but no, when change happens, change happens fast. Our world is faced by so many ills that I'm not going to catalog them. But in broad terms, we have the growth of inequality and opportunity for students. You're saddled with such debts that you can't even leave school and think of anything but paying them back. For working people, real wages are lower today than they were in 1964. For people without jobs and without opportunities, the world is a very frightening place. And yet, the pay for corporate executives has skyrocketed. And corporate executives make 3,000 times their average employee. Fast food executives makes 1,200 times their average employee, and it's not just about money. It's about political power. It's about being able to control this society, and that's got to change. And that is one of the two civilization issues that are facing us. Are we looking forward to a world of opportunity or a return to aristocracy and oligarchy? The second issue of equal importance is the right to live in a livable planet. Yes. Climate change, poisoning the environment. We are destroying 
the life support systems upon which our human civilization is based. And, and greedy corporate powers don't think about their grandchildren. They only think about the bottom line. And once again, those same people who have redistrib redistributed wealth on their behalf are, re are, are refusing to allow the necessary activities to come to a livable planet, to preserve the climate, to preserve the life-giving ecosystems of the world. So we have a huge, <coughs> huge agenda before us. I'm going to conclude. Think of the students in Hong Kong. Think of the university students. Think of the high school students. Do what you can do day in, day out. It will all come together, and we shall prevail. Thank you. The next speaker is Amanda Armstrong, a graduate student uh, here at UC in the Department of Rhetoric. Amanda. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, so I'm Amanda Armstrong. I'm a graduate student in the rhetoric department. Um, can I pull it? Can I hold it? Yeah. In our department, we think a lot about words and their force. So I thought it would be appropriate for me to start by commenting on a few powerful words spoken here half a century ago. There is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels and upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. There is a time. 1964 was such a time. Students and civil rights organizers faced routine police harassment and possible arrest for tabling on campus in support of racial justice. Thousands of students found this odious, so they struck and shut down California Hall. 1969 was another such time. Students of color were facing routinized, structural white supremacy at all levels of the university. In response, they formed a coalition and struck for the opening of a third world college. It was only when Oakland municipal workers decided to strike in solidarity with the students that the administration conceded to the formation of ethnic studies programs at Berkeley. These were times when students and workers called a stop to the operations of the machine. It's interesting that Mario Savio uses the metaphor of the machine. The metaphor suggests that the university is like a factory, that students are made into objects and exploited by its operations, but that, like workers, students have the capacity to strike. The metaphor also says something about the rhythms of university operations. The operations of a machine don't change much over time. Machines repeat the same actions over and over. And if they are halted one day, they can start up again the next day. The metaphor of the machine carries a difficult truth about our history, that the gears grind on and that in significant ways their operations remain odious today. It's a truth that many of us who inherit the struggles of the 60s know all too well. We know that the struggle continues. We know because every few years administrators threaten the budgets of eth ethnic studies departments. We know because they have been hiking our tuition, our health care costs, and our rents, making our university less and less public. Because they refuse to divest from fossil fuels or from Israeli apartheid. Because the former head of the Department of Homeland Security is now the president of our university. And because when students take collective action, we are still met with police cars and billy clubs. It was an encounter with a police car that sparked the free speech movement 50 years ago today. And it was traumatic encounters with police lines that turned Occupy encampments into mass strikes here three years ago. These moments of collective action, as fleeting as they have been, 
have shown that we do have the power to call a stop to university operations. We have the power to shut this place down. And we have the power to change aspects of how things work here. In 1965, students succeeded in getting rid of the ban on political advocacy on campus. In 69, students established ethnic studies programs. This was followed in 76 with the establishment of women and gender studies. In the 80s, student strikes and mass direct actions forced the university to di divest more than $3 billion from South African apartheid. <laughs> and in 2012, strikes and other collective actions helped win a freeze on in-state tuition hikes. <laughs> we will likely need to strike in the coming year to maintain this tuition freeze and to begin to chip away at the costs and debt students take on to come here. Just last year, workers struck to ensure that they and those who come after them could retire in dignity. We struck as well to push the university to support undocumented students, transgender students, and student parents. Last year, students of color also took action to say no to Napolitano when she first visited campus in the spring. If you want to help carry forward these and other struggles this year, please come to the General Assembly at 5.30 this evening in Wheeler Hall. Mario Savio said that there are times to put our bodies on the line, the put of, to put our bodies against the gears of the university. He also said that until we are free, the present moment is one of these times. For all who remain sick at heart at the unfreedom of the university, we can feel that now is still one of those times. Do you feel sick at heart? Yes. yes! Until the machine is dismantled, we live in a moment ripe for collective action. Whose university? Yes. Our university! Whose university? 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 Our university! Our university. Okay, I have just a couple of announcements before our last speaker. Uh, right after this rally at 1.30 in the Maud Fife Room, which is 315 Wheeler Hall, the Berkeley Faculty Association will be having a really great panel. It's got Wendy Brown, Political Science Department, Tyrone Hayes, Integrative Bi Biology, Lee Rayford, African American Studies, and Amanda, whom you just saw, and Chris Newfield from UC Santa Barbara English Department. They will be talking about the university then and now and taking a look at some of the thing, trends that have happened during that time. And following that, the Progressive Coalition students will be holding uh, a panel in the same room. So. Just go over to the Maud Fife Room in Wheeler and you'll have it all. Tomorrow night, you're invited to attend the Mario Savio Memorial Lecture with Saru Jayaraman. She is a restaurant worker organizer and the director of, food, of the Food Labor Policy Institute here at Berkeley. You hear how the workers supported the students back in 1964. Let's show today's workers that we support them. Come to the, they are building, the restaurant workers in this country are building a movement and they may be out in the streets. Let's show them that we are there for them. That will be tomorrow night in Wheeler Auditorium at eight o'clock, doors open at seven. Um, now, the last speaker today unfortunately, could not be here in, in the flesh. But his voice, he's been quoted frequently throughout this rally, his voice should be heard because it was a voice that inspired thousands of students in 1964. We have two clips. We don't know if the technology will cooperate, but if you will be patient and listen carefully, 
we're going to give it a try. So first, the speech that was given to the students in 1964 on December 2nd, and then the victory speech a week later on December 9th. Just small excerpts from both of them. Whoops. Because our direct connection failed, you have to listen closely. This may not be loud enough. in which sit-ins and civil disobedience and whatever, at least two major ways in which it can occur. One, when a law exists, is promulgated, which is totally unacceptable to people, and they violate it again and again and again until it's rescinded. Appeal. All right. But there's another way. There's another way. Sometimes the fall of the law is such to render impossible its effective violation. As a message, I have it repealed. Sometimes the grievances of people are more, extend more to more than just the law, extend to a whole mode of arbitrary power, a whole mode of arbitrary exercise of arbitrary power. And that's what we have here. We have an autocracy which, run, which runs this university. It's managed. We were told the following. If President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the regents in his telephone conversation, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. I ask you to consider. If this is a firm, and if the Board of Regents are the Board of Directors, and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager, then I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees, and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be, have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. second mode of civil disobedience. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. that there be no, no restrictions on the content of speech save those provided by the courts. And that's, that's an enormous amount of freedom. And people can say things within, within that area of freedom which are not responsible. And now that's, you know, we've finally gotten into a position where we have to consider being responsible because, you know, now we have the freedom within which to be responsible. And I'd like to say, well, at this time, I'm confident, I'm confident that the students and the faculty, the University of California, will exercise their freedom with the same responsibility they've shown in winning their freedom. That concludes this rally. Thank you for attending. Please celebrate the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement by going out and doing whatever you can for the causes that you believe in. Thank you. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome.
Okay. 